Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? So myself, I'm Kathy Fitzpatrick. I am the program coordinator at the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm. Our presenter today is Pat McKay. He's the museum manager here at the farm as well. Welcome everyone to our Brown Bag Lunch. This is a monthly program that the museum does in cooperation with the Rochester Avon Historical Society. And um, we've been doing this for a, a number of, um, of months and we really try to look at local history, really focus on our, our local story as, a, as opposed to doing some broader historical themes. Our um, last month we did the very earliest parts of our, our community's history from 1817 to to uh, 1871. And we realize that when we say 1817, it's not fair. We're not recognizing uh, the Native Americans that were here uh, possibly thousands of years before the white European settlers came. So we're trying to be very sensitive to that. Um, I did a program in September also that talked about the summer of 1816. And the summer of 1816 was called the year without a summer. And that's what really precipitated people to move here in 1817. Uh, in 1816, there was, um, first of all, there was massive volcanic eruptions, the largest ever recorded in the history of the world, um, you know, as, as long as people have been able to record things like that, um, in, in 1815. And, uh, and, and it really had an effect on the weather by 1816, this year without a summer, and it didn't affect the Midwest. So um, Michigan was not affected. And so it didn't take long for people who got tired of ice skating on ponds on the 4th of July and had frost in, in July, August, and September. Um, to give up farming in the, in the East Coast and, and head for the Midwest where we were not affected. And there was beautiful farmland here too. So it was, um, you, know, start, you start seeing what happens and what starts those waves of migration. The program today is 1872 to 1952. Um, this is a cooperative program with the Rochester Avon Historical Society. We appreciate the, the collaboration we have. And uh, we're gonna do one more um, in the month of November. And we'll talk about that. I think it's my last slide. So we'll, um, We'll uh, talk about that a little bit more. For people not familiar with the museum, um, we're a, a kind of a campus of buildings. We have uh, the 1840 Van Hoosen Farmhouse where we're doing our program today. And it's kind of the centerpiece of the farm. It's where our museum started 41 years ago. Um, and over the course of time, we've been able to add the Little Red House, which is a, a tenant farmhouse. That's part of this little village called Stony Creek that we're in. Um, the Van Hoosen barns and farm are a, a big component of our operation. It's um, where we do a lot of our exhibits and programs. We have 16 acres of garden and grounds. We have the Stony Creek Schoolhouse and uh, really just want to encourage everyone to come out and visit us. We also have what we're really proud of is our archival um, collection. And in anything I talk about today and anything program we ever do, we're always talking about our archives and how important they are. And so, you know, we always, you know, throw the little, um, the only appeal during the whole program here is, you know, if you ever want to help us, um, you know, put money towards our, our archives. We're always trying to digitize and you put things in acid-free folders and, and put everything online so we can share it with you. And we want you to be um, appreciative and, um, and fascinated by this remarkable story um, in our own community here. So a lot of it is online and if we can ever help you, by all means, let us know. So jumping into our program, you know, in 1872, um, that's the turning point in Rochester's history. It really is, um, everything, um, before 1872 and everything after 1872 happened because of one event and it's the railroad coming to Rochester. And yet you look at it, it's a 90 year history. It's not, it's not 200 year history and it's not even here today. So it's really a fascinating story, but you know, transportation was always the key. When you talk about economic development, transportation is how you get your products from where they're being made to where the consumers are. And Rochester was a small isolated little town and our customers were our next door neighbors or the people down the street. Um, but when the railroad came, our customers were in Detroit or when they were in New York City. Um, they were, they were our, our, you know, our, our wings unfolded and we had a chance then to, to touch the world. And it was just a, a remarkable opportunity. The Detroit Bay City Railroad ran between Detroit and Bay City. And at some point it extended beyond Bay City and went all the way up to Saginaw and then all the way to Mackinac. And so, um, we were able to take advantage of all the lumber and uh, you know, just the bustling towns in Bay City and Saginaw as the, uh, the logging industry was taking off there. And Detroit was a, certainly a, a booming community too because they had water transportation and the Detroit River and these raw materials from the Upper Peninsula were able to come to Detroit. So Rochester was, was well positioned. Uh, today we call that Detroit Bay City Railroad, the Paint Creek Trail. And so kind of went north and south. And then in 1879, we were fortunate to have another railroad come into town. That railroad you know, went across our community east to west. And um, 
you know, from the East Point, it was really in Richmond, Michigan. I had always thought it went all the way to Port Huron, but really Richmond was, uh, was a terminus. And then it went all the way through our town, eventually making its way towards Chicago. And that was the Grand Trunk Railroad. Today, we call that the Clinton River Trail. So a lot of us know these, these railroads based on the bike paths that they are today. But when you look in 1876, the Newberry Elevator, you know, we call it the Rochester Elevator today. And uh, they were able to ship 300,000 bushels of grain. That's, that's some serious, um, that's some serious shipping going on. And then when you look at the lower picture too on my, on my screen, you know, you see people all dressed up. And that's why, you know, they could, at six o'clock at night, they could catch that train. And when they woke up in the morning, they were in New York City. So imagine that all of a sudden, for people who had never gone more than five miles from home in their whole lifetime, suddenly, instantaneously, this place called New York City was within reach. Within overnight, you could be in New York City. It was the game changer in Rochester's history. And a lot of things that we'll do will always point back towards uh, 1872. And other things that we'll talk about, you know, suddenly when you have trains coming into town, you suddenly have salespeople coming into town. And these salespeople needed a place to stay and they needed a livery stable so they could get horses. And then they brought their, you know, housewives and farmers would order their farm implements and new sewing machines and lightning rods for their buildings. And it, it just all of a sudden, you know, we doubled the economic uh, the number of businesses in our town. Um, from 1871 to 1872, it doubled. And so that's, you know, that's never happened, you know, since then, I'm not sure it'll ever happen again, where one year we double our economic output of one community. So, you know, hotels on Main Street, yep, uh, we had two of them there. And, and then by 1907, 30 trains a day were coming through Rochester. You see eight of them were passenger trains. That's pretty remarkable. This is a town that was, was really booming and um, we were really based on the railroad. And, you know, nowadays we're not even, uh, used to hearing that train whistle. The other thing you'll see are uh, um, uh, an advertisement here for uh, Rochester Bakery and oysters. All of a sudden, oysters became this craze. What you can't see, unfortunately, I'm going to circle it with my mouse. Um, there's a sign right there that says oysters. You know, you see all the dead chickens hanging in the window, the giant hogs hanging on the side. You don't see that in downtown Rochester. But oysters became quite a craze because you could finally get fresh seafood in Rochester. So um, we started finding lots of advertisements where somebody was having a party or a church picnic or um, some kind of community service club was having an event. And they would always mention that oysters were being served because they could, it was a new delicacy in town. And you start seeing all these businesses that came into town. And the other part about transportation, it wasn't just the railroad. You know, by the 1890s, the Detroit United Railway, and it has a couple of names. We, the Detroit United Railway, the DUR, which are the acronyms, um, the interurban, there's a couple of different names for it. But this is a picture of it, and this is the South Hill Bridge, the trestle uh, that um, uh, preceded the, the concrete bridge that we know of today. And this electric cable car system here came, and you'll see the newspaper article underneath it. And we quote our newspapers quite a bit. This is September 30th, 1899. I'll read it to you. The advent of an electric railroad, electric road in Rochester, marks a new era in our beautiful city, as it brings us in closer in touch with the outside world, and without doubt will be the means of bringing a largely increased population to the city. People of means are continually looking for good places in which to locate and Rochester presents peculiarly fitting advantages, not only as a resident city, but a business center as well. So people were very excited. Now realize with the interurban, 60 trains a day are coming through downtown Rochester. So between the interurban car with 60 trains, the railroad with 30, we have 90 trains a day coming through Rochester. And today um, we don't have trains at all. We have no, no, no connection though. The uh, map on the side shows the interurban line. And if you follow it out of Detroit, it, it comes up um, eventually onto Rochester Road. It really came up Livernois to South Boulevard. And at South Boulevard, it came over a mile then to Rochester Road, up to Rochester Road. And then you see it once again, it branches off. And these are key times when, when you see two railroads kind of come together, um, it makes one place very popular. And so we were pulling people from Flint, which, is, which means all the way from Saginaw, coming all the way down and from Imlay City in, over in Macomb County and Lapeer County. And they were all funneling through what was called Orion Junction at the, at the intersection of Tinkin and Rochester Road. And then at some point they would get on these trains. And so the businesses in, in downtown Rochester were, were booming. This was a very successful time. Orion Junction, you know, we certainly don't have any evidence of these buildings here anymore. Orion Junction, the buildings there in the upper left. Um, the car barns, we were also fortunate in Rochester that the car barns, the maintenance barns, and the power supply were all located in downtown Rochester. It's where the Atala Heart Center is located today, right on Main Street. So across from La Puma's, Coney Island, and kind of where the Rochester Hills Public Library is, that 
probably is in the general area. Um, and so there was a giant smokestack there. And so we had electricity, suddenly that was available. Um, we also had, you know, down the middle of Main Street, we had a set of railroad tracks. And at some point there were two sets of railroad tracks because it was so busy there. What's very difficult to see in the pictures is the overhead uh, power lines. You know, they wash out in these archival images, but there would have been, I always call it a spaghetti of overhead power lines. And you think that, you know, it'd be so great to have this mass transit system. Well, with the mass transit comes a spaghetti of overhead power lines. You know, that was the way these were all electric vehicles. So they were, they were silent. And we do have some phenomenal images um, of the inner urban, um, of horses and wagons and the automobile. They were all on the streets of Rochester at the same time. So some people were still hanging on to the horses and wagons. Some people were able to afford an automobile. A lot of people were still using the mass transit system. And so we have pictures of all this stuff going on and they would just collide on Main Street. And by colliding, I mean, they really collided on Main Street. There were some horrific accidents as horses were spooked by, um, by the inner urban cars coming. And sometimes the inner urban cars went fast. And, um, and there were some real challenges that came with some grow, growing pains with that. And then you see the January 1918 storm. Um, that's a monster storm right there. And you'll see this is Main Street going up to South Hill. And Sarah Van Hoosen Jones covers it pretty in, intensively in her book, uh, The Chronicle of Van Hoosen Centenary Farm. She talks about that farm and how hard it was for her, her men who were just determined to get milk from the Van Hoosen farm to the hospitals and schools of Detroit. And they, they went overnight and it took 24 hours by horse and wagon and they were able to get a load there. And she, they talked about how well they were treated in the hospitals when they finally arrived. And you'll start seeing some, a, a little bit of evidence, you know, today when they did the Main Street makeover several years back, you, we start seeing evidence of these rails um, underneath the, the asphalt. Um, most of the rails were pulled up and, um, and during World War II, all that iron was reused as part of the war effort. In that middle picture, you'll see where there's two train tracks going down um, the middle of Main Street. And the building off to the right is um, the St. James Hotel today. It would be Bean and Leaf. And so um, that's a whole different look than what we're used to in, in Main Street in Rochester. So, um, you know, the upper picture, you see, you'll see, you see the rails, you see a car on the left, you see a horse and wagon on the right. So it's kind of interesting. So the whole lifespan of the inner urban was 1899, which falls right into the you know, time frame of what we're talking about today. And by 1933, the whole system was completely shut down. Um, Bob Michalka has just published a book. It, it came out in March and we were in the process of really trying to promote that as part of our Founders Day celebration. And of course the COVID crisis hit and um, we never had a chance to really unveil that book, but it is for sale at the Rochester City Hall. I would highly encourage everyone to get a copy. There are pictures in there we've never seen before. But at one point there were 7,000 miles of inner urban track all over the Midwest. So the Midwest was connected. And um, towns like Rochester that were very rural and very agricultural were suddenly connected to the outside world. So it was, it was a game changer and yet it lasted 30 years. And when we look for the evidence of the inner urban line now in Rochester, you know, if, some, if there was something I could point to to say, oh yeah, this was the inner urban, there is nothing. There is, there is no evidence of the inner urban line, especially south of Rochester, nothing at all. All down Rochester Road to South Boulevard, down Livernois, there's nothing. Um, if you go up um, maybe along Orion Road, there's a few places if you really know where to look. Um, there's some berms maybe that are, are because it paralleled Orion Road quite a bit. And you know how Orion Road is a twisty, windy road. Well, the inner urban was twisting and crossing that road a couple of times too. And uh, would have been pretty dangerous. Although I don't think cars were going as fast as they probably go now, but um, very little. You see some of the evidence underneath uh, the asphalt. Um, some of those rails were pulled out and uh, we have a couple of them here at the museum. They're just sitting outside rusting. We don't really know what, quite what to do with those either. You know, and, pre and part of this is part of the um, inner urban line coming here. It allowed people, just like the train did, it allowed people to live in Rochester and Avon Township and work in Detroit. And so suddenly you could commute. You didn't have to live in Detroit and work in Detroit. You could live outside of town. And that's exactly what happened. Um, this is a, a picture. This is not one of my you know, handicrafted um, um, uh, maps that I hand drew for you. This is in uh, the history of Avon Township uh, by Eula Frey. Um, the book was written in the 1940s and this is uh, the map that was included in it. It looks, a, it looks a little rough if somebody was sketching on the back of a napkin and made it into the book. But you start seeing the subdivisions here and it, and it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise that most of the subdivisions are on the south side of town to so along Auburn Road and South Boulevard. And, and that just keeps, changing and changing as you go further north. And I'm gonna show you some maps here in a minute here. It's a pretty interesting to watch how 
our town has populated uh, over the last um, 140, uh, 200 years. And uh, we, we have a map and it, it's really cool. I'll show you in a minute. But just start seeing the names of some of these subdivisions. And some of them are familiar, like Hammond Place is where Hamlin Elementary School and Bordines is at, at Auburn Road, or Hamlin Road and um, Rochester Road. Um, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden our town just started kind of growing more and more as we were able to uh, get people to shuttle back and forth. This is the map I was talking about. I'm just, I just have to sit here and talk a little bit while this is uh, populating. Right now it's going to start showing you, it's going to start populating what Rochester looked like um, as people first moved here in 1817. These are white European settlers. I don't have maps that show the Native American um, uh, settlements that were here because there were some. Um, we do have some evidence of that. Most of it's archaeological evidence and 99.9% .9 of it's been destroyed by development. So there's really nothing to even look for. Um, and so now if you can see that the first date, 1817 to 1949 is in blue. Now in red, we're going to do the decade of the 50s. And so you look at this and you still start seeing whole sections of our city, one square miles that still don't have any, hardly any houses in it. And the 1950s, this is still a very rural area where people are pheasant hunting and deer hunting. And you, know, you can do that up to the 1970s almost here. So now, okay, now the 1960s. So the blue area shows the 19, everything up to the 1950s. And now you'll start seeing how we populated in the 1960s. And more and more, you start seeing how each uh, established subdivision starts having more and more um, all the lots start infilling and, um, you know, the roads are gravel roads and slowly they're starting to be paved roads because at some point, you know, people just couldn't, couldn't drive cars down the gravel roads. They just didn't hold up in the wintertime. In the 1970s, you really start seeing a boom. And in fact, that's a, here, here's, a, here's my comment to you is what decade do you think is the busiest in, in uh, Rochester's history just by looking at these maps. This map is on our website. It's on the City of Rochester Hills website. If you go there and search historical maps, this exact map is on there. And uh, our billing department or somebody in our MIS department, somebody made this map and they said, hey, this is kind of cool. And they sent it to me and I said, gosh, can you put this on the, on the website? Everyone should see it. So now then you look at the 1980s and you say, oh my gosh, by the 1980s, this town was full. And then you look at what happened in the 1980s and you look at the development that happened here. And, and um, you know, it, this, this, is, this is still a lot of building going on. And then you say, oh my gosh, so we finally topped out in, you know, by 1989. And then you look at 1990 and you just keep seeing, you know, what's filling up in this town. I think the map ends here in 1999. So, um, but it's amazing how each decade over the last 50 years, how busy it has been. And um, there's really been no, no um, slowdown in growth. And boy, if you look today around town, if you're in the Rochester area, I know some people are and are zooming in from Utah and, and um, lots of wide open spaces. Um, boy, this town is booming even today. So it is still a lot going on here. So um, when we look at some of our most important buildings, you know, I talked about the railroad being the, the service that really changed our history. There's a couple buildings that changed the direction of Rochester too. And one of them is the Western Knitting Mill. Um, today, the Rochester Mills Beer Company is there. Um, you know, a variety of bu buildings in there. And, you know, fortunately, Frank Rewald and Son and Roy Rewald saved that building. It's to me the most significant building in Rochester's history is the, is the knitting mill. But re remember, that's just my opinion. Um, it's just from looking at it and realizing how many people work there. And you know, you realize that these farmers have 100,000 sheep and they need to process that wool. Now the building you see there didn't last. It burned in, in, in 1867. And uh, by 1891, um, it was rebuilt. And it was rebuilt, um, made out of brick, so it wouldn't burn anymore you know, they started getting a little smarter about, about fire safety. And this real tall tower, when you go there today, it's really one of the iconic parts of that whole building. That's a fire lookout that was designed there. They got a little fire uh, tax uh, break on their uh, property taxes because they uh, provided a fire lookout at nighttime when uh, everyone was sleeping, there was a firefighter up there looking for problems. Um, the dormitories on the on the south side of the building, the lot is still there. It's still an empty lot. It looks like it's a parking lot. It's kind of between the knitting mill and the fire station. Um, and that's where dormitories were. And the dormitories were used because they needed more employees. And, you know, you don't see ads that say girls wanted very often in the newspapers. It's usually not for the appropriate things. Um, but Girls wanted steady work and good pay Western knitting mills. Um, full page ads were taken out. And, uh, and Dr. I'm sorry, Reverend Collicott, who was a minister in downtown Rochester, he was from Calumet and uh, Ishpeming and, and knew that there was unemployed people up there. 
um, already the copper mine has had started diminishing that whole industry. And um, he started encouraging people from the Upper Peninsula to move to Rochester. And they said there was a little migration. There's a Cornish migration of people from um, various countries that had moved to the Upper Peninsula and now we're looking for work and relocating into the Rochester area. Um, so the dormitories were built in 1913. We, do, these, we have a couple pictures of them. I have no images on the inside. I don't know what the conditions were. Let's assume that they were nice. Let's just say that. Um, by 1927, the mill closed, but boy, it opened up over and over again. Every time Rochester was in a crisis, this mill would open up again. And you say, how important was it? I mean, did the whole community build it or just a bunch of, a bunch of rich guys? Here's the story we found in the Rochester era in 1890. I'm gonna read this to you. Ground was broken early last Monday morning as it was not long before 100 men were at work digging a trench 150 feet by 140 feet by five feet by three feet. All worked, all worked with a will and determination and by six o'clock the work was nearly completed. It is estimated that over 200 of our citizens handled shovels and threw out dirt during the day. Every businessman in town who was physically able was on hand and right nobly did the work go. It was a great day for Rochester and our citizens will never regret the efforts put forth to bring this gigantic enterprise, the second largest of its kind in the United States, to this village. Is that the greatest story ever? It's just to imagine that 200 of our residents went and helped build a building so that you know, we could bring people here to work and you know, hundreds and hundreds of people were here um, working. So, you know, other buildings that looked like the same size as the Western Knitting Mill is this one, the Rochester Sugar Mill. Certainly during the same time period, in 1899, the Detroit Sugar Company comes here and they build a, a mill on what we call a Woodward Street. Back then it was called Sugar Avenue. And that's Pink Creek, the, the creek you see in the, in the background. It would, would have been located across the street from Dillman and Upton. So it would have been, um, I think today it's Solaronics is there, but I think that, that building was closed. But Solaronics, Hallback Field, uh, JC Field, I think the, some of the sports fields there, Mr. C's Auto Wash, are all on that site, and um, it was a huge operation. The problem is the sugar, um, sugar beets don't grow very well in Rochester. This is not the home of sugar beets. If you know Michigan's history, sugar beets grow up north in the thumb of Michigan. So uh, Vassar, Frankenmuth, Taro, that's where Taro syrup comes from. Um, that's where sugar beets are. That's where they have better soil up there. And the farmers in this area grew sugar beets, now, but the sugar, the beets didn't have um, all the, the best sugar content. They weren't as strong as, uh, as the sugar beets up in the thumb of Michigan. And the farmers were treated very nicely by the owners of the mill. They were required to wait in line sometimes for days at a time before their sugar beets would be analyzed and a price would be negotiated for a load. And uh, farmers didn't have that kind of patience and time to spend days sitting around when they had so much work to do back at the farm. So it didn't take long before farmers switched what they were growing and they were suddenly growing um, soybeans and corn and wheat and alfalfa. Um, some of the ads you'll see here, the, you know, they showed the farmers coming to the mill with a 600 pound sugar beet. I don't think that ever happened, but it's, uh, you know, our newspapers are really great documentations of what happened in the past. And when we look much more recently, you know, World War II era, 1940s, um, the game changer in Rochester's history is National Twister L. And today it's the U-Haul. Um, um, complex up at the corner of Tinkin and Rochester, but it employed 1,500 people. And that's, that's by far the largest employer, I'm sure, in Avon Township. Most of all, the locals would say that they would have to adjust your, your, your clocks at your house based on the shift changes. There were three shift changes because it was 24 hours a day and they were operating during the World War II. And I've heard stories where, you know, the rivets made for every naval ship and every airplane in the uh, in World War II came through this uh, factory. So it was a very significant, uh, we do have pictures of a guard towers on top of the building with, um, well, in fact, even in this picture, you can see the fence going right along uh, Rochester Road and then along Tinkin Road. Um, there was also coiled barbed wire on top of that. And then in the forties, during the war, there was a guard shack up on top. And I'm sure somebody with a high powered rifle and a scope was up there to protect that building. So, um, but they made uh, precision drilling equipment and um, drills and, um, and it, that operated well through the 1970s and 80s, I believe. It was sold to Siemens Automotive. And uh, today, there's a variety of businesses still in there. And it's really the next big corner, I think, of um, economic development. That there's, there's still a huge chunk of property there. But I'm sure there's, it's a brownfield. It's probably got some contamination that they have to deal with. Um, so they'll have to deal with that. But, you know, <clears throat> business watch, what's going to happen in the next 50 years? That'll be one of the major um, changes, I think, in our town is the redevelopment of that corner in some probably some 
more retail that will go up in that area. Um, we're also fortunate in this town, you know, we, we have these Western Knitting Mill, we have um, Twist Rail, we have the railroad, and we have five major corporate farms that, um, you know, there were lots of moms and pops uh, out there. Everybody had a cow in the backyard and chickens and, and all that. So a lot of people were making a living uh, farming, but we had five corporate farms and these were major, major farms. One of them being Parkdale. Parkdale was a biological farm. And um, um, they started off in downtown Detroit. And that's where their laboratories were. And they had animals down there. But at some point, they, the city of Detroit grew up and um, they, couldn't, uh, they, they couldn't have a place to keep all their animals. They needed a place to raise their animals. And with the interurban line connecting downtown Detroit to this rural area of Rochester, they were able to buy 300 acres in 1907 and start the Parkdale Biological Farm. Today, it's called Par Pharmaceutical. Um, so it's on the corner of Parkdale Road and Letica. You know, roughly the, the, bar, the barns you see right here with the horses um, were right where the OPC is located today in Rochester. Uh, the horses you'll see there, horses were used for a tetanus uh, vaccine. Horses blood and human blood are very similar. And so they would inject the horse with tetanus. The horse's body would fight it and create antibodies and white blood cells. And then unfortunately the Norby horse um, that you'll see a picture of eventually was, was bled. And uh, that blood then was sent down to Detroit and made into serum for human. And no animal that ever lived at Parkdale ever was uh, released from there. Um, they were all destroyed. So, you know, that's a sad part of the story. Um, but it's also at a time when there is no, no way, they, there's no such thing as synthetic drugs or any other way of doing it. So, um, you know, everything from rabbits to guinea pigs to cattle. Cattle were used for a, a smallpox vaccine. Um, you know, as we may know, the polio vaccine, in fact, that's coming up here in a minute. Um, was manufactured here, it wasn't discovered here, but it was manufactured in Rochester. And, and um, Par Pharmaceutical is still there, but uh, they're still doing sterile um, things um, right in, and still producing things there and still a major employer, probably the largest employer in Rochester right now is still Par Pharmaceutical on the same site. And here you see a card for the polio pioneer. Mary Eberlein uh, gave us her card as part of our archives. I don't know if Mary's zoomed in with us today, but um, we're just fortunate to have one. This, that, mean, that meant that she was one of those very, very brave kindergartners or first graders whose mom and dad pushed them to the front of the line and said, you know, my kid wants the shot so they can avoid getting polio. So that would have been a important part of uh, everybody. She went to Woodward School, which is uh, unfortunately been torn down, but she was a polio pioneer. Um, you heard some of the other farms that we talk about, you know, in, in 1902, the DM Ferry, um, uh, DM Ferry, so we call a Ferry Morris Seed Farm. And so the Morris, the Morris Company, the Ferry Company merged together and created the Ferry Morris Seed Company. So we have this biological farm. Now we have a seed farm. And the seed farm is located roughly where, boy, Target. Is that a good place? Everybody knows where Target is at the corner of Auburn and Rochester Road. But it took one square mile. So it went all the way up to Hamlin Road, all the way over to John R., all the way back down. We have some phenomenal um, uh, corporate photographs is what I would call it. And, and uh, just the unbelievable number of buildings and massive buildings that they use as part of this farm. It's just, uh, it's off the charts. It's hard to believe. There's very little left today. Um, the, the buildings you see in the lower corner are on the golf course at Hampton in the Hampton complex. There's a little uh, golf course in there. And then there's a couple buildings in the cemetery right behind Bordines. They have a couple of the barns uh, left in there that they have repurposed, but there's hardly any evidence. Um, you know what, there's, there's um, if you know where to look in the subdivision, there are rows and rows of pine trees that were planted in 1935 as, as little seedlings. Today they're about 200 feet tall and they were planted to be windbreaks um, so the soil would not blow away. And then you say, well, how, how come they're not here still? I mean, you know, Par Pharmaceutical is still here. They're still on the same site as the biological farm. And the problem with um, Ferry Moore Seed Company is all the rest of us have moved here. And as we started planting our crops in our own gardens, suddenly they started cross-pollinating with the seeds that were purebred stock out of Ferry Morris. And so we started diluting their, their purebred stock. So they moved to the West Coast so they could avoid that wind pollination. And they're still out there today. You can still get uh, seeds for your garden next spring um, when you're doing that. So in 1944, uh, Ferry Morris left. Howard McGregor bought it to be part of his stock farm. And uh, here's a couple of them we'll talk about. You know, we, we're here at the Van Hoosen farm, so we were dairy. Meadowbrook was a horse and cattle farm, and uh, Great Oaks was the stock farm. And we know these names. You know, the Van Hoosen farm is where the Rochester Hills Museum is located today. Meadowbrook farm is now called Oakland University, and Meadowbrook Hall is still there. And you just see these spectacular 
beautiful buildings there. Some, um, many of them have burned in some pretty spectacular fires. And then in the lower left corner, you see the great oaks, and this is a stock farm. So you see the stock farm was not competing with the dairy. They all had different things um, in different markets that they were reaching. Um, Sarah Van Hoosen Jones was raising purebred Holstein cattle, and she was exporting them to Argentina, Venezuela, and Costa Rica. She could do that because she could speak five languages and could do international business. So there was just some remarkable things that were happening in our town um, in the, at the turn of the century. Um, as we start talking about education and how our town has changed since the 1870s, um, you know, the Harrison School and the Harrison Building is, is still there. It's, it's still part of the school administration building. And when you look at this building, it's just an iconic building in, in Rochester. Unfortunately, this big cupola right here is not there anymore. And my story that I, I know of is, um, is uh, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison and, and Debbie Larson from the Rochester Avon Historical Society has just recently wrote a story about um, who, who William Harrison was. And it's, a, it's another phenomenal story that came from Debbie Larson. And she talks about William Harrison. You know, you want to say, oh, it must have been the superintendent of the schools or the principal of the school or the elected officials. And it was not. He was the custodian at the building and uh, was beloved. And he would ring the bell up in that bell tower. And the story was that he would ring it. And when he stopped ringing the bell, if you were not in your seats, you know, a child would be marked tardy or would be punished. And he certainly didn't want to see that happen. So he would start ringing the bell and he could see kids running to school you know, from the streets of Rochester because it's on the highest point of land. And he would ring that bell until he felt assured that every kid was sitting in their seat. And so pretty soon these kids started realizing that he had their back. And uh, he was a very beloved uh, um, person and that everybody knew because they all had gone through the schools, the one school in downtown. And I think he worked at the schools for, for more than 40 years. So it's a fitting tribute to Mr. Harrison. And then the building has been added on to numerous times. You know, you would go in as a kindergarten in one door and you'd go on as a senior in high school out the other. And then as our town grew up, of course, you know, we had to build other buildings and um, separate buildings were made, but then they've all been connected together so that they create what's now the Rochester School Administration Building. It's a great building to walk through. It's a little more difficult now with the COVID situation, but a lot of the graduating senior pictures are all for each class is uh, hanging on the walls there. And we're going to figure out how to digitize those and get those out there so everyone can and reflect back on those. Um, but, um, but you see all the way up through 1929, a 16 room addition was added and, and uh, everything was connected. And these buildings are still there today. Some beautiful, beautiful architecture up there. And then we start talking about the one room schoolhouses besides downtown Rochester. You have to realize there were 12 to 13 other one room schoolhouses around. And those, those schoolhouses were located in, in Avon Township, which is now called Rochester Hills. They were in Oakland Township and a couple in Washington Township. We had um, the Mount Vernon School. Even to this day, there's a chunk of Macomb County that still sends students to Rochester. It's a, kind of an interesting, must have been a very controversial, you know, when they draw boundary lines because you want those students coming because that helps pay your bills. Um, the lower corner, the lower picture here is our Stony Creek School. That's part of our museum complex here. It was this picture that um, inspired us to build an outhouse. And, uh, and uh, we've just gone through some more renovation on that building to take the vinyl siding off and go back to the original wood siding. And that building is just in remarkable, great condition right now. We're really proud of it. But um, they said that the, the two most controversial issues in American history have been slavery, the abolition of the, the getting rid of slavery. And number two was the consolidation of schools, where all these one room schoolhouses had to give up the power, which meant the local parents served as the school board and they had to give up their power of educating their students and hiring a teacher and give it to a school board and your kid would go somewhere else to school, not walk to school. And so that was a very, very contentious time. And um, it's still probably something that we need to explore a little bit more, but it was, not a, it was not a pretty or happy time in Rochester's history. People did not want to give up their, um, the power of educating their students. And, and, and when, I, when I think about a contentious time, it means that it's so important that we have to argue about it and we have to talk about it. And I think that's important. I think that's important today because we, we talk about roads, we complain about roads, we complain about politics, we complain about schools, or we're concerned about it, or we're talking about the amount of money being spent because they're so important and they've been so important for 150 years. So uh, it's good to see that, that, that we still take those things very seriously. The last of the schools in Rochester to consolidate with the Rochester Community Schools was Stony Creek. And Stony Creek was getting money from Twisterell at the corner of Tinkin and Rochester. So they, they were well funded and they didn't have a, a problem. It wasn't until the Rochester School started charging exorbitant fees 
for the students from Stony Creek who want to go to high school, because I think Stony Creek school is only going to eighth grade. Um, they priced uh, the school right out of the market. They couldn't send their kids to high school, so they finally joined in. And these are, once again, some newspaper articles you start seeing where the school districts were, were located. And we've done it as best we can to try and document where every school was. We do have a little publication for five bucks that's on the history of um, schools in the Rochester area. And, and Tiffany Fizerman, who's uh, the president of the Rochester Avon Historical Society, helped us write that. So she did a lot of the research and really helped us pull all these details and pictures and everything together. Other things that we talk about during this time period of 1817 to 19, or 1870 to 1952 is World War I. Um, the flag you see with these two women, one of them looks like she's wearing some, a soldier's coat and hat. Um, boy, you can barely see, it's all a little washed out across the top. It says Stony Creek there. And this flag, or this reproduction of this flag is flying in our roundabout up here by the Stony Creek Schoolhouse. Um, if you drive by, you'll see it. Um, and we have that flag flying there because um, our long-term plan is to put an American flag there, but we don't have a light uh, set up yet. And we're probably gonna end up putting a solar power light there. And, um, but until we can illuminate an American flag being flown 24 hours a day, we, you know, we don't feel like it's the right thing to do to put that up there. So we're commemorating, these are the soldiers, uh, each of the stars there commemorates soldiers from Stony Creek, one of the only communities in, in the United States that sent every single eligible man to the war in the first round of the first draft. And um, the good news was our soldiers all returned home they realize they returned home to the middle of a flu pandemic too. So, um, but this flag flew here in Stony Creek Village. We have some remarkable stories about it. Um, we're not going to go into right now, but they're just humbling and tear jerking uh, stories here. And, and we have listing of all the names of all the soldiers. And you look at these charts and these old maps and, and old calendars, um, boy, that, they're names that you, you kind of recognize in town. So um, would have been a, would have been a scary time when you're sending our soldiers off to, off to war and then only to, um, repeated again with World War II. In World War II, Rochester became significant. And I mentioned the twist drill, making rivets for all the ships and airplanes. But um, at the Western Knitting Mill, which is now the Rochester Mold Beer Company, that building was retrofitted. In World War I, it was retrofitted to make um, uh, uniforms, khaki uniforms for the soldiers. Before that, during the Depression, it made woolen clothing for the men who were working in the CCCs, the Civilian Conservation Corps. By World War II, it was outfitted to make what you see, this picture, the photo flash bomb, M46. Use magnesium, which burns very bright, it's a white light. And um, the risk we had, of course, is that if, if any of these ever detonated and detonated that factory in downtown Rochester, it would have leveled the entire downtown, about six blocks of downtown Rochester would have been leveled. So that's a little dangerous. They did test some of the powder and they did it out on South Street. Um, outside of where Byers Towing is on South Street. And it's the bottom of the hill as you go up South Street towards uh, Bloomer Park. Um, out in the woods there, there are some bunkers out there where they tested some of these uh, bombs. And there were, they, it was not always successful. People were killed. And usually if anybody was killed, it was a woman because the men were all gone and the women were running these factories. And there were some accidents and um, terrible, terrible accidents. And we have images where, um, you know, every tree is obliterated. So you can tell there are some some high potency to these things, but these were these were dropped from um, uh, they were shot from cannons and dropped from airplanes, and they would burn bright, and that it would be so bright that it would illuminate battlefields and the ocean, so they could look for periscopes. If you were in the navy, you could look for enemy and enemy maneuvers. If you were in the army, and um, one of the top three producing factories in the United States of photo flash bombs was Rochester, Michigan. So, um, yeah, this little story here. I'm going to tell another one about Roderick uh, Roderick Arnold. Technical Sergeant Roderick Arnold of Rochester was stationed aboard the B-29 named Boxcar when it dropped the second atomic bomb over Nagasaki, Japan, and ended World War II. You know, and I'm sorry, I don't know, I'm gonna repeat that same information here in, a, in the next slide, I think, oops. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, Roderick Arnold is one of, our, um, one of our really great soldiers when we talk about him. He was right there. In the, in the middle of it. Um, you know, we, a lot of people know of the Enola Gay. The Enola Gay dropped off, that was the name of the airplane that dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Um, Roderick Arnold from Rochester was on the plane boxcar that dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. And that's ultimately, that's what ended World War II. And uh, he was there, he was from Rochester, Michigan. I think he was a navigator. I don't know if it says that on there. Um, some of these other soldiers, you know, we've, we've, we've done lots of exhibits on soldiers and you know, it, it's the right thing to do to recognize the men and women that had served our community. And um, 
and we have been able to capture a lot of stories. We certainly don't have them all. If you're, um, if you have a story on uh, on a soldier from World War II, uh, an ancestor, um, you know, we focus on the ones from the Rochester, Michigan area or Avon Township. Um, we love telling the story, um, and it's never fair just to tell the story about you know the men that were soldiers because women were involved in that too. And you'll see the picture on the right was Priscilla. Joy trip, and I apologize. I'm going to read something to you. Um, I don't have this one up here, but it's a newspaper article again. This is March 30th, 1944. Um, Lieutenant Priscilla Joy Tripp is in Anzio, um, which is uh, one of the terrible battles of World War II in Italy. And so um, the Rochester era wrote this. That they reprinted a, a letter that she wrote home. You know, and this is what they did. And back then, when kids would write letters to their parents, the parents would run it to the newspaper and they would print it. It says Lieutenant Priscilla Joy Tripp writes home saying to her parents that she is all right and for them not to worry about her. Under such conditions, if you were writing home, what do you think would be the prime important thing? Would you be worried for fear the Germans would drive our boys into the sea as they have threatened? Would you be trying to fake illness so you could get out of that hot place? Not Priscilla Tripp. Priscilla wants vegetables. It says she took a walk the other Sunday and found a huge field of turnips growing. She appropriated an armful, took them to camp, washed and peeled and ate them raw, and wrote her mother it was her first fresh vegetable since landing in Italy says her unit now keeps constantly going to and from the turnip field, appropriating more and more turnips to eat. While Priscilla didn't say so, it can be presumed that the Italian owner of the turnips is far away from the beachhead. Does Priscilla fear our boys will retreat? No. Priscilla says she thinks her group will be there long enough to plant, grow, and harvest a crop of quick-growing vegetables. She asked her mother to send her a supply of seeds for the more quick-growing types of vegetables and Mrs. Tripp relayed her message to Ferry Morris Seed Farm and they have provided her with seed and them of our seeds is on their way to Italy and Priscilla now. Priscilla returned home to Rochester in February 1945. Her brother Lieutenant Harry S. Tripp was killed in action in, uh, at the German front on November 16, 1944. You know just a Sad story when you see the sacrifice that our residents in Rochester made in World War II. And I'm sure it's a story repeated throughout um, the United States. And our town was right there shoulder to shoulder with them. And you see how we recognize our town. This was a, this was a big deal in our town after World War II. And this was our monument. You know, we have a, a Civil War monument. It's the um, Billy Yang statue in the Mount Avon Cemetery. And then Lieutenant Sam Harris donated the drinking fountain. That's next to Rochester City Hall. Those are kind of our Civil War monuments. Um, for World War II, we do have um, um, this monument that you know, was located throughout downtown Rochester, Rochester kind of disappeared for a couple of years. There's quite a story behind it, um, but was relocated. Um, and through efforts of the Rochester Avon Historical Society, um, the monument was put back together, heroically put back together. It was a huge project and uh, really a lot of kudos when you see what your membership and how you can help the Rochester Avon Historical Society. These are the projects you can take on when you have a membership that's very active and involved. So that's my little sales pitch to help people become members of the Rochester Avon Historical Society. The picture on the right is a gentleman who is the mayor of Rochester, England. And uh, he was here visiting our town and they took him to the uh, World War II monument. So still there today next to Rochester City Hall. Um, and so this is both basically my talk through 1952. Um, and so then you say, well, for crying out loud, that, that's a lot going on <laughs> from all these major factories being built and transportation systems, um, you know, that came and went. And, and, you know, now we're a little more exposed to expressways and, and wider roads and faster traffic and all that. So you say, so what could possibly happen in this town over the next 68 years, bringing us to the year 2020? Well, that's my next program. In November, um, normally we do it on the first Tuesdays of the month. Um, on, um, but not unfortunately, um, um, to celebrate um, the first Tuesday of the month of November, we do have this little election going on to the presidential election. And I, we, don't, we didn't wanna compete with that. So we're gonna do it on Thursday of that week um, at 12 noon. And we're gonna do the 1960s in Rochester. What happened in one decade in Rochester, 1960s. And, um, and boy, you just say, what, what could possibly have happened? Oh my goodness, you know, the number of schools and churches and, and things that we take so for granted that are around our town. The 60s were the turning point. And I, every decade now I say, you know, that's the turning point. We have a whole program just on the 1920s. This in one decade, all the things that happened in 1920s. So it's been um, just fascinating for us. You know, the newspapers are um, a crucial part of our archives. And we've always identified that the newspapers are the most important archival documents that we have at the museum. And we're happy to announce that uh, as of yesterday, 
Um, we, have, we, we have scanned all of our, digitally scanned our newspapers and they're searchable PDF documents so you can look at them too. You can type in anything you want and, and if you have trouble with that, you call us and we'll help you do that. So if there's any topic or any person, any, anything you're looking for, ask, let us know how we can help you. Um, but we only had them scanned up to about 1950 and now we're gonna scan the rest of them. Now bring our newspapers all the way up to the 1980s. Um, even uh, some people might remember the eccentric and the clarion newspapers. For those papers, the eccentric, all we had were microfilm. We never had the hard copies. When, uh, when the eccentric left Rochester, they gave us their uh, microfilm. So we're digitizing the microfilm too. So I'm um, not exactly sure what quality we'll get and we're not sure we have every single issue. You know, when we always go back to the flu epidemic of 1918, you know, we always want to see how our town was covering that. We don't have any issue from 1918. So as World War I is starting, as the flu epidemic is sweeping across our country, we don't have any newspapers. So we, we there's periodically um, um, issues that are missing, but we're gonna um, start digitizing our newspapers. They should be done by the end of the year and we'll figure out some way of celebrating. I might ask Tiffany if we can someday do a program just on newspapers. And then as part of it, um, we were talking that we'll um, maybe, you know, on the chat boxes, people can just fire questions in and we'll search the newspapers right there while you're in front of us and start seeing how it all works. So. Um, so our next one on, on the screen, you can see the next brown bag lunch will be on Thursday, November 5th at 12 noon. It'll be Rochester in the 1960s. Um, you know, if you ha have more um, questions or want to be more involved with either the Rochester Hills Museum or the Rochester Avon Historical Society, their websites are, are located there. We both have membership programs and appreciate your financial support. Just want to kind of keep this going and preserving uh, the history of our town. You know, our town does have some remarkable stories that are almost unbelievable to think about and how many we have. And every one of them is just, you know, it's one of those I start off by saying, you're never going to believe this. Um, and maybe every town in America has those stories and they don't know about it. Um, but because we have the support of our community and, and this rich history um, and, and interest in saving it, we've been able to really document these stories. And we hope that ultimately it inspires people and inspires them to be active in their community. This is one of those towns where I say, where when our town needed something, when there was a service or a business or something that we really needed, this is a town where everybody stood up, and stepped forward instead of stepping back. You know, when, when the teachers ever asked for a volunteer, I always found myself stepping backwards and casting my eyes to the ground. In Rochester, people raised their hands, they stepped forward and said, pick me. And um, you know, we've seen that and that's why we have a universe in this town. This is why we have a hospital in this town. This is why we have Avon players in our town. It's because we've had leaders, we've had exceptional philanthropists and we still rely on people, you know, whether you're listening to this program or a member of the museum, you ultimately, you're the ones who are helping make this all happen. So we appreciate your support. Um, the museum continues to do programs. Tomorrow night, I'm doing a program on um, the most fascinating photographs that we have in the museum archival collection. Tomorrow night, if you remember, it was supposed to be a lecture on, on the forest fires of Michigan in 1871 and 1881. Unfortunately, our speaker passed away in early September. And so we wanted to still do something and engage with you and, and, uh, and still talk local history. And we've got lots of stories to tell. We're looking forward to doing the, the 1960s one. I'm gonna see if Kathy has any questions that people have sending, been sending in. If you have any that I can answer, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'll, I'll let Kathy pipe in here if she's out there. Hey, Pat, it actually looks like we're all clear. No questions on our end. So if you guys do think of any, you can give us a call at the museum, shoot us an email um, or stop by. Um, to give us a call ahead though with construction and COVID, we don't always have someone in the office who are wandering the grounds as well. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Patrick, for such a wonderful program today. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming.